Um, so, Vash, I'm told that you've said some not very nice things about <laughs> me and are not a big fan of Rising. I'll be honest with you, I haven't actually watched, so I'm going to assume everything was said in, like, good faith and substantive, etc. Um, I can't watch. Why do you assume that? Too much of a fragile, special snowflake to um, to actually watch. But tell me, just tell me in your own words, like, what was your issue with Rising, with me, with me working with Sagar? Like, lay that out for me. Um, so I won't speak ill of Sagar because I don't want to put you in a position where you have to defend, like, a coworker. Um, yeah. In front of me, because I think that's a real <laughs> Well, game. listen, I, you know, Sagar has plenty of cringe views yeah, that I'm she happy to tell him. She to, won't defend to him, face, no. So go ahead. No, okay. Well, I just, yeah, I just, I know, because I've been put in that position, like, oh, you have to defend your friends, whatever. So I, I'll say this much. I've seen a lot of your solo content in the past couple of months, um, and I find it generally extremely agreeable. I think that... Um, I think that you have a very specific intention when you do your work on Rising, that you when you work with Sagar, right? And it's to convince people fundamentally that the Democratic Party is bad. This is a noble goal, okay? It's one that I agree with. <laughs> um, and it's, it's one that I think that you are very effective in delivering in many instances as well, because some of the, uh, the some of the, um, the blatant hypocrisies of the Democratic Party, um, I feel like they can be very it can be very difficult to call them out unless you're willing to go like full hog on it. You know what I mean? Going mm. the, the full hog. You, you really go into it. And I respect the hell out of that. Sometimes I feel like these criticisms, um, they implicitly downplay the threat of the Republican Party, which mm. works sometimes as a rhetorical strategy. Because, again, the more afraid people are of the Republican Party, the more likely they are to accept anything the Democratic Party will give them. So you need to do that to an extent. But at the same time, I disagreed with the extent to which you seem to at some points. One of the big examples being the January 6th Capitol riots, you know. Now, did I think this was going to, like, overthrow the U.S.? No. God, no. Like, the crazies invading the building, whatever. The the main threat, I thought, was the normalization of the January 6th Capitol riots by basically the entire Republican Party. Like mm. that time they normalize it. Sure. Next time, maybe a couple Democratic senators take a cap through the forehead when they stand too close to an open window, you know, and then we start seeing those justifications. Eventually, we start talking about, you know, beer hall putches, which is what I'm trying to stay away from. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think you misread my intention, though, a little bit. Um, and I also would say, like, I think if you watch my coverage or our coverage of January 6th, I would certainly let Sagar speak for himself, but I was certainly as, like, appalled and condemning as you possibly could be of that particular event. More of my intention with Rising and the work that I'm doing with Sagar um, which you you probably know, like we just did our last rising, but we have new things coming. So it's not like my partnership with Sagar is ending. Um, best of luck. Well, thank you. More of the intention is right now, I feel, and you can tell me if you think that this this is correct, that the country is splitting along sectarian lines in a way that is really, I think, very troubling and, and maybe one of, in my views, the biggest um, problems that the country faces. Now, as Kyle said, in terms of like elected leaders or thought leaders in Washington who are populist, right? No, it's a, it's a total fraud. But do I know from working in West Virginia and growing up in rural Virginia and living in Kentucky, living in the Rust Belt in Ohio, do I know that there are people there who have um, economic views that we could very much work with who are very mistrustful of the establishments of both party, who could potentially be brought into a true, actual multiracial working class coalition. Yeah, I believe in that. And so the project of rising and in working with Sagar in general is more in, in finding ways where we can actually view regular, pe have regular people view each other, not as the enemy recognizing that actually your adversary is the people who are who are holding power, who are keeping the status quo system in place versus like if you go on Tucker, if you watch what Tucker does, he's saying like you need to be afraid of your neighbor. Your neighbor is an existential threat. Yeah, and he does culture war bullshit and all the time. And you see a lot of that coming from plenty of, you know, mainline Democrats as well of like, these people are different. They're evil. They want to destroy the, they're fascist. They're all racist. All of them are irredeemable. 
And are there racists who voted for Donald? Of course. Yeah. Are there plenty of people with like bad views? A hundred. Yeah, sure. But to dismiss the entire half of the country as like, those are evil, bad, irredeemable people. I think that leads the country in a very bad place. So I think maybe some of the criticism of Sagar and I that I've really reflected on and that I used to, I used to kind of like object to is this idea that maybe we emphasize our commonalities too much. But as I've, as I've reflected on that, that's actually intentional because we get people who have watched us truly across the entire ideological spectrum who come to us and routinely say like, you know, it's a right wing person, but they still respect me. And they, they come to realize like, oh, so this person in my life who has very different politics than me, I don't, they're not the enemy. We're able to talk about politics again. We don't hate each other. We've been able to heal those relationships. So that's actually more of the intent um, of the show than just like making people think that the Democratic Party is bad, which I'm also happy to, you know, I gave Biden a lot of credit when he did the vaccine, like the patent protection and said, hey, we shouldn't do that, even though I'm waiting for follow up on that. So where they do good things, I try to give them credit. And it's really not the core of what I'm all about to convince people that the Democratic Party is like uniquely evil. OK, I think that's a completely fair rebuttal. Um, the. Um... The, the thing you said about, like, don't demonize your neighbor, I think is extremely important because one of the biggest problems that we have when or that I have, I get because I, I debate a lot of people. I bring people on all the time. Hundreds of people at this point now I've talked to. And one of the big um, one of the biggest things I notice from Republicans is a sense of insecurity. And I don't mean that in like a haha, like you're a beta male or whatever type way. I mean that in a feeling that the culture is leaving them behind and they are preemptively despised by basically every institution in this country right. from Hollywood to the mainstream news to the Democratic voters, which outnumber them. And that if they're going to be despised, they might as well stop caring about what they want anyway. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very destructive um, on, on, on in every way, a very destructive process politically. At the end of the day, I mean, we're all sociological agents. There's nothing inherently leftist about me. If I was born to a different set of parents, I probably could have been a conservative or a moderate Democrat or a neo-Nazi or a Ku Klux Klaner. We're all very well molded by our environments. And to condemn people morally for the misfortune of having been born into circumstances which maybe led them down an ideological path I disagree with, it doesn't do anything. The condemnation is meaningless. I also so, think there's a very oh. selective uh, form of forgiveness that can exist on the left. Like, I'm opposed to the death penalty. I'm opposed to the mass incarceration state that we have. I think people who, you know, have served their time should be able to reenter society and have full and productive lives. I think they should be able to vote. I think they should be able to. And that's like, a, you know, I think everybody on the left would basically agree with that. But then there are other areas where if you, you know, say or do the wrong thing or hold the wrong view, it's, we're done with you. Right. There's there's no coming back. You're not allowed back in the circle. And um that's something I really disagree with. And I'll be honest with you, Vash, like, especially back during the um, the protest movement over the summer, um, it was really it was tense at times between Sagar and I. And that was probably the, the most difficult period of the show because we had both of us had very strongly held views that did not <laughs> did not line up whatsoever. And so I did some soul searching at that point of like, you know, what, what, what am I doing? Is this sustainable? Is this good? And I guess what I really came back to is Sagar is and you don't you don't know him personally. So, you know, you don't have insight to seeing this. But Sagar yeah. is as good faith an actor and as honest an actor and as good of a partner as he could possibly be. So I was like, if I can't even talk to Sagar, like we're fucked as a country. Like here he is, he agrees with me on like 70% of things and is just like, trusts me and believes in my good intentions and really wants to hear me out and see my point. Like if I can't handle that debate with this person, then how can we expect anyone in the country to be able to like have a reasonable partnership or debate with anyone? Who can I jump in? Can I interject for a sec? Just okay. sorry, real quick. I want to yeah, hop no, in real quick. Yeah. Um, the reason why you felt that at that particular time is because the view that he was espousing you thought was not within the bounds of respectable discourse. And I actually agree with you on that because his whole argument was like, 
yeah, bring in the army to like crack down domestically on protesters. That's deeply against the First Amendment. That's deeply authoritarian. That's you view that as outside of the bounds of reason. And some other times when he disagrees with you, you might not think it's outside the bounds of reason, yeah. like mm -hmm. uh, on the issue of guns or maybe on the issue of abortion or whatever it might be. Yeah. You might think, yeah, I don't agree don't with you, but I see it. Yeah. <laughs> but this was one where you're like, no, not only do I not agree with you, I don't even see your point, And I think you're like actively hostile. Yeah. So I think that's Just, why it was very difficult. That, but that gets to uh, the more important point is, and this happens with discourse all the time. Where are your actual red lines where you're like, hey, if you believe this, I can't even be friends with you. You know, if somebody's pro genocide, you're not going to be like, well, we just disagree. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. So like there are red mm -hmm. lines, but then there's other things that you might disagree, but they're not red lines. So right. I think that's why it was hard for you at that point. Well, and, and just to add to that, and then I want to hear what you have to say, Vosh, is like, yeah, that that's exactly why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then it also is the case that there's a large portion of Americans who well, agree with his views. That's and, why which you is stayed, what I think. was like so uncomfortable about the whole situation. We saw like 70 percent. There was a poll that was like 70 percent or something agree with deploying the military in U.S. streets. And so you were like, I guess if it's 70 percent of the country, I have to argue against this position, basically, yeah. was your point. Anyway, yes. I'm Go sorry, ahead, Vosh. We just No, no, I, I run into that all the time. I am frequently disappointed with the popularity of some of the positions that people sometimes I argue against a position online. And I think nobody actually believes this. I'm wasting my time. This is some Tell the scandal. Bullshit. Talk about the scandal and, that just happened. No, no, no. Wait, Why hold on. Maybe in a oh. second. Okay, hold on. I, uh. We just put, we just put <laughs> poured water on that fire. Uh, so okay. So a couple things. First of all, um, again, I, I don't I don't like arguing against people who aren't here. So I'll just say I cordially invite Sagar to an arm wrestle anytime. If we have to. <laughs> That's we we can keep it to that. You know, it's good. I've been I've been working out lately. I think I can do it. You know, I'm feeling strong. Um, He's the, been hitting the peloton what, hard during quarantine. I don't know, Vosh. All right. Hey, you know what? I invite the challenge. Um, <laughs> One of the issues I have, because this is kind of the problem I have with right populism, it feels like. It feels like every discussion I have with a right populist is like we agree for 40 minutes. Yeah, the establishment is bad. Workers in this country are being oppressed. Yeah, the media is like a, a like a, an oligarchy that's being used to distract people from meaningful issues. And then they get caught on some culture war talking point and instantly swap into fascism, like in a nanosecond. Like – I can spend all this time agreeing with them at a point, and then it'll be like, oh, yeah, but Black Lives Matter is burning cities down, so we have to revoke citizenship and deport people and use, like, Secret Service black bags to take protesters <laughs> away and interrogate them to find out which anarchist cells are ruling there. These are – so, again, we're not talking – sorry, but I've had convos with people like this. Yeah. But it's a thing I've noticed, too. Same with trans issues, too. People will agree on, like – Everything like, yeah, you know, I think workers need more rights. I think the Republican Party has gone crazy. I think et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, trans women using the same bathroom as my daughter. I don't know. So I'm going to abandon every other position I've just spent the past 40 minutes agreeing with you on and vote Republican because I'm that in favor of whatever meaningless virtue signal anti-civil rights bills they're going to pass that'll last three years before they get overturned and the whole country moves on from this. And that's a, a pattern that I've noticed. And it. I don't know how much being anti-establishment means if you're willing to drop all of it, right. it over a culture war issue. 